afternoon. Welcome to the daily briefing. We have a few items at the top, and then I am happy to open it up for questions. The travel update. Secretary Kerry is currently en route to Algiers, Algeria, where he will resume his trip schedule as planned. Today, the Secretary co-chaired the U.S.-EU Energy Council meeting this morning. On the margins of this meeting, he met with German Foreign Minister Steinmeier, U.K. Foreign Secretary Haig, Polish Foreign Minister Sikorski, and Norway's Foreign Minister Brende. Uh, those all happened on the sidelines of the U.S.-EU meetings. He remains in touch with the U.S. Middle East negotiating team on the ground and today has spoken over the phone to both Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, and Palestinian President Abbas. Finally, he's conducted several other calls with foreign counterparts, including with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. Second item at the top, uh, in terms of Egypt, you may have seen a statement we released by our embassy in Cairo earlier today, but I'd like to reiterate uh, here that the United States condemns in the strongest terms the terrorist attacks uh, that took place near Cairo University earlier today, which killed at least one individual and injured many more. I believe it was uh, two or three bombs that went off near the university. As we have said before, there is absolutely no justification for such attacks. We extend our condolences to the families and friends of those who were killed and our hopes for the swift and full recovery of those who were injured. With that, Laura, kick us off. Um, uh, well, sure. I was just going to start off actually with um, Do you have a quick follow-up on Egypt and then I, we'll do Lavrov and then we'll go in. Just, just real simple on Egypt. Okay. Um, I, I believe, according to our reports, it's a brigadier, a police brigadier general who was killed in this this morning. I, you may not have that confirmed. I don't have that confirmed. The, the simple question I wanted to ask is, even though I understand your condemnation of it, uh, do you have any belief that such violence, reprehensible as it may be, simply reflects the failure of the Egyptian governing authorities to reach any kind of a political accommodation with large parts of their society. I mean, is, is, it, or is, is there not some responsibility on the other side, on their side, to try to reach out to their opponents? Well, I don't want to venture to guess why terrorists would undertake these kind of attacks near university. Uh, I don't believe anyone's claimed responsibility, but let me be clear that under no circumstances is this kind of terrorism acceptable. Uh, what we've encouraged both the government and the opposition to do is work together without violence uh, to forge a path forward for Egypt. And I don't have the detail about the person who was killed. Lavrov. Do you have some details on uh -huh. the or readout on the call? I do. During a brief phone call with Foreign Minister Lavrov this morning, Secretary Kerry conveyed the strong support he was hearing for the people of Ukraine and the legitimate government of Ukraine from his counterparts during his NATO meetings in Brussels. Secretary Kerry reiterated the objective of de-escalating the crisis in Ukraine, including through engagement, direct engagement, between Ukrainian and Russian officials and the return of Russian uh, troops to their barracks. And he once again conveyed the importance of Russia sitting down at the table uh, with the government of Ukraine. Um, Again, it was a brief call. Did he initiate the call or did... Uh, I'm not sure who initiated the call. Did you see the reports um, by General Breedlove yesterday mm -hmm. regarding um, the capabilities of the Russian forces amassing on the Ukraine border? Mm -hmm. His assessment was that the, there were enough forces and they'd brought the whole kit that they could go in, invade, overtake things in a matter of days. Does the State Department agree with that assessment? Well, I'm certainly not going to disagree with the military assessment of one of our top commanders. Uh, as we've said throughout this entire uh, situation, we are very concerned about the Russian troops amassed on the border. We've said uh, that we can't confirm independently reports that even a small number have been pulled back. That still remains the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are uh, sitting on the border where we've said they should not be anymore. And maybe the better question is, what is the United States prepared to do about this? Well, uh, I don't know if you're specifically asking about something uh, concrete or specific. I don't know exactly what you're referring to, but I would make a few points about what we did at NATO yesterday. Uh, as a direct result of Russia's actions in Ukraine yesterday, NATO decided to suspend all practical civilian and military cooperation between NATO and Russia. Uh, political dialogue will continue uh, as necessary at the ambassadorial level and above. I think I also have a few points on some other uh, reassurance we've done. Uh, in recent weeks, we've augmented NATO's Baltic Air Policing mission with six additional F-15s. We've deployed 12 F-16s to Poland to train with the Polish Air Force. Uh, we've extended the deployment of the USX Truxton in the Black Sea 
And now that it has departed, another naval vessel is on its way to the Black Sea. And again, yesterday, NATO members pledged their support to help, as we do this, other NATO members to do so as well. And do you have any idea how many U.S. forces or troops might be sent in for NATO exercises in Ukraine? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, in response, obviously, to the concerns raised by NATO allies, uh, uh, we have uh, tasked the Supreme Allied Commander, obviously, General Breedlove, to develop recommendations for additional reassurance measures for our Baltic and Central European allies. Uh, as Secretary said yesterday, to make clear that our commitment to Article 5 is unwavering. I don't have a prediction for what those recommendations might look like. Uh -huh. You reiterated all the points that I, I think were being made before I went on vacation, which was um, his support for the people of Ukraine, uh, desire. Our support for the people has not changed since yes. we've been on vacation. That yes. is true. Yes, no, that's good. <laughs> Nor has the crisis, though. Um, de escalating the crisis, mm -hmm. Ukrainian Russian talks, r Russian troops returning to their barracks. Have you made any progress, you, do you think, in achieving any of those ends? Well, uh, first, we haven't seen further escalation by Russia, which I do think is uh, a good thing. Obviously, we want to see de escalation now. So I know there was a lot of talk about what the Russians might do, and we haven't seen them take further steps. Uh, in terms of some of the uh, augmenting in terms of NATO, I think some of that is new in terms of what we've sent to the region, to the Baltic states and our other NATO allies to reassure them. Uh, we've also uh, had yesterday uh, Congress finally pass a monetary assistance package that provides loan guarantees to Ukraine and also further sanctions some Russian uh, officials, I believe. So on the uh, support on the economic side, we've moved forward with that as well. Uh, we've moved forward with two rounds of sanctions, I think probably since you've been on vacation. Uh, I, I can't remember when you left, Arshad. Um, uh, but look, we've been working very closely uh, directly with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov to see if there's a diplomatic path forward here. Uh, so that process continues. Uh, it's a difficult one, but it does continue. Are there any plans for them to meet again, the Secretary and Lavrov? Uh, I don't know of any plans specifically uh, to meet in person. But we've, all, we've said uh, after their meeting in Paris that they will continue to be in consultation with each other, and if they need to meet again somewhere, uh, they will. You did confirm that a, a U.S. vessel is going to the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Do you know what kind of vessel is it? Is it a, like a, a destroyer? Is it a, I don't know. I'm or happy is it a task check. force? What is it? I'm happy to check. And okay. our, my colleagues at the Defense Department probably um, have more details. Okay. And do you have an assessment of the size of the Russian military that is you know, deployed on, on the border? Well, what we've said is there are tens of thousands of Russian okay. troops there. We haven't gotten into specifics here. I know there are a wide range of reports, but uh, the bottom line is there are too many, and they okay. need to not be on the border anymore, and they need to pull back. As I said at the beginning, we can't independently confirm that even a small number has yeah. been pulled back from the border. Obviously, we need to see much more movement there. Uh, are they on their side of the border? It's my understanding, yes. Okay, thank you. Can we change topics? We can. Anything else on Ukraine? Yes. Okay, one more on Who's Ukraine. The you mentioned many times, I mean, it was mentioned that the, the escalation of the, mm -hmm. the, the crisis. In the meantime, there is a movement of more troops or more equipment, military equipment in the Eastern Europe. How do you justify or how do you explain to regular people what that's, that's not a dis the escalation or escalation? Well, it's, it's a response to escalatory moves that Russia has already taken and a response to the fact that they haven't taken moves to de-escalate. So obviously one of the cornerstones uh, of our NATO alliances is the goal of a Euro-Atlantic a Euro region, whole, free, and at peace. And what the Russians have done with their actions is threaten that. And uh, we have been very clear that if the Russians don't de-escalate, we will take steps in response to their escalation. Uh, so that's what we've done. Uh, they're the ones who sent troops into another country and attempted to annex it. They're the ones who have undertaken uh, actions that are in contravention of international law, the actions that we've taken are fully consistent with our NATO alliance and partnership. There is another question related to the race in Eastern Europe in particular and some other places mm -hmm. related to the Ukraine and, uh, and related to the American role. I, I, is United States is transferring what the Ukrainians are demanding or trying to do or it's the, proposing its own suggestions? Well, obviously, uh, our goal throughout this process has been for the Ukrainians to decide their future. So while we are, yes, in talks with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, all of the uh, topics for discussion on the table are fully, 100 percent coordinated with the Ukrainians. These are ideas the Ukrainians themselves have talked to us about and, and now the Russians about directly and also very publicly. Monitors, de-escalation, returning to their barracks. These are all things the Ukrainians themselves are putting on the table. 
we are playing a role, obviously, in these discussions. But any discussions we're having back and forth with the Russians are ideas that the Ukrainians are, are really feeding into. So but that's why we've also said there needs to be direct dialogue between Ukraine and Russia. Just to follow up to what you say, there are two issues, which is like first uh, some changes in the constitution of the Ukraine in order to give some more rights to the, the Crimean and Russians mm -hmm. or all these things. And the other concept is the concept of federation. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and another issue was raised last week. It was the possibility or the necessity of putting international monitors. Mm -hmm. Are these issues are still on the table? So a couple points on that. On federalism, obviously, as I've said, any decisions about the future of Ukraine need to be made by the Ukrainians themselves. And I do believe the government of Ukraine has made it clear that they're willing to work towards constitutional reform and ready to do so. Uh, that they're ready to grant greater autonomy for Crimea and to take other steps to address le legitimate issues regarding mi minorities in Ukraine. So the government said they're willing to, but uh, on any issue, whether it's federalism or any other issue, the Russians don't get to decide that the Ukrainians need to. Uh, on the issue of monitors, absolutely, yes, that is certainly part of uh, what we need to see in terms of de-escalation. Uh, there are a number of monitors from the OSCE and elsewhere who are ready to go into Crimea. Some of them are in Ukraine, but we believe they need to be able to go to all parts of Ukraine, including Crimea. To my knowledge, they haven't gotten in yet, but I'm happy to check on it. Update. So just last one. I mean, mm -hmm. when the issue of Crimea was raised, there was always this fear or whatever we can call it or expectation that similar thing may have happened in Moldova. Mm -hmm. Are still this fear is there or it's gone? Well, we remain concerned about any possible Russian escalation anywhere, uh, including in Moldova. And I don't know if you saw the announcement this week that we are providing an additional $10 million in assistance to Moldova. Assistant Secretary Newland announced it during her trip there earlier this week. It will provide equipment and training to the Moldovan Border Police and Customs Service. I would note that uh, over the last 20 years, our assistance to Moldova has totaled approximately $1.2 billion, including over $22 million just in fiscal year 2013 alone. So obviously we are working uh, very closely with the Moldovan government on a range of issues and are concerned, of course, about Russian escalatory moves anywhere in the region. Anything else on Ukraine? Okay. Is sending the warship uh, to the Black Sea escalating uh, the force in the area? Well, I think I just addressed that. It's not. It's response to Russia's escalatory action. We said we would take steps uh, to respond to that escalatory action. And alternatively, if they de-escalated, we would take steps uh, in response to that as well. So this is fully in line with our commitment to defend our NATO allies, uh, fully in line with those commitments we all signed up for. Uh, and Russia is the one who has taken steps that are not in line with their international obligations. Because yesterday in Brussels, the secretary said that USS Truxton would remain in the Black Sea, and mm -hmm. now we hear reports that Truxton was not in the Black Sea yep. and is returning. Yeah, we extended the deployment of the Truxton, and now it's departed. We are sending another U.S. naval vessel to the Black Sea to would replace it. Would it have the same offensive capabilities as a guided missile I, destroyer? I, I'm going to check on what kind of uh, vessel it is. I know you're the expert on this, but let me check on that, and I'll check with my colleagues at DOD and see what they have. You're welcome. It's a destroyer, probably, because according to the to we'll DOD officials, but... Uh, well, what this is, filled us in from DOD. Uh, yeah, what, what is the reason that you submitted to Turkish government to use the Turkish Straits for access uh, of these warships to the Black Sea? What is the reason that you sent... What, what, What's the reason we're working with the NATO ally to reassure our NATO allies on this issue? No, ac no according to the international law, you have to submit a reason to Turkish government to uh -huh. use the Turkish Straits. So I'm okay, happy I'm to check and see what the reason was, if there's officially a reason submitted. Obviously, Turkey's a NATO ally, and yeah. this is all about uh, our NATO alliance and how we reassure our NATO partners that we will stand by them. So you're sending this That's warship. my reason. Let me see if there's an official reason given. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, actually, uh, so you mean Turkey when you are talking about to, de de to defend the NATO ally. I'm talking about the Baltic states. I'm talking about a whole number of, of folks. The Black in the Sea. Uh huh. This is the yep. This naval vessel is currently on its way to the Black Sea. Yes. Yes. And so you are talking about Turkey when? I just said I'm talking about a number of NATO allies in terms of how we want to bolster our defenses there, not just Turkey. We care about all of them. No, when the Black. I mean, when, when it's I'm not going to get into geography lesson with you here. Let's so move on. We are bolstering our defense because uh, the United States is bolstering its defense because diplomacy is not working. No, uh, because it's the prudent thing to do, because the Secretary just had conversations with our NATO allies uh, following uh, Russia's military intervention, and they asked for General Breedlove to look into how we could further do this. Uh, we can do two things at once. Obviously, we're working a diplomatic track, but we need to have uh, things in place that do reassure our allies. Uh, 
you know, in case the diplomatic track takes longer than we want or while we try to make progress on it. Yes, on Ukraine. Ukraine. Uh -huh. Because I just remember, remember this. Uh, related to the energy, mm -hmm. I mean, it was take, some steps are taken already to raise the price that the, of the gas is passing yes. to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yes. So do you have anything about mm -hmm. that, especially that you mentioned at the beginning there was a meeting today yes. with EU? Yes, we do. I have a little bit on that. So okay. we very uh, strongly believe the country should not use supply or pricing terms uh, as tools of coercion to interfere in other countries' uh, affairs in Ukraine or anywhere else. So yesterday Russia did raise the price of natural gas for Ukraine by more than 40 percent. Today President Putin signed into law uh, to abrogate the 2010 agreement between Ukraine and Russia in which Russia pays rents and provides a 30 percent reduction in gas prices. So it looks like uh, Ukraine's gas prices will be going up even further. I would note that the average price EU members pay for natural gas, despite the greater distance to ship it from Russia to these countries, is about $370 per thousand cubic meters. Ukraine is now paying $385, a price which is going to go up, uh, despite the shorter uh, distance it has to travel. So we are taking immediate steps to assist Ukraine. Today, Secretary Kerry and Department of Energy Deputy Secretary Poneman were in Brussels, as I said, for the Energy Council meeting. They talked to our EU partners about energy security specifically, not just for Ukraine, but for all of Europe. Uh, and we are taking some steps, including providing emergency finance and technical assistance in energy security and energy sector reform. So, so we'll keep working with them on it. Obviously, it's something we're concerned the about. The issue with the EU for a while, that it's, it was raised after this crisis, mm -hmm. that at least most of them, if not Germany in particular, between 30 to 40 percent of their needs are coming from the Russian gas and the oil. Mm -hmm. So how it, was this issue discussed to, to little by little replace it or it's, like it's too far to do it? Well, we have worked with Ukraine and other allies on its western borders to encourage them to prepare to reverse natural gas flows in some of their pipelines currently so that Ukraine can access additional gas supplies if needed. Uh, we've made the point certainly to Russia, but with our partners as well, that if Russia, uh, any disruption of Russia's shipments to Ukraine and the rest of Europe is actually a losing situation for Russia, uh, who needs to, to sell this and, and would lose out the most from this. So we are obviously working uh, with our European partners on this and believe energy security is an incredibly important issue. We'll continue the conversations. Can we take topics? We can. Yeah. One more. Mm -hmm. um, the Justice Department uh, today announced that a Ukrainian industrialist, Dmitry Firtash, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a member of India's parliament and four other people have been indicted uh, for mm -hmm. being involved in a suspected corruption scheme of trying to bribe uh, Indian officials. Do you have anything on that? I don't, and not anything beyond the release they put out okay. at the Justice Department. And you, have you, got, you haven't gotten any protests from the Indians about this? Or? I'll check. I know the indictment just can't, came out. Yes, I just, oh. one. Hmm. just one. Clarify. There yeah. are three countries who have calls to Black Sea in the area, Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey. Uh -huh. uh, it's safe to assume that the uh, U.S. is sending this warship to defend those three NATO allies in the area? We are sending warships, F-16s, F F-15s, a whole host of items to the region to defend our NATO allies writ large. I'm not going to get in what specifically is used to defend what country. Obviously, it's just a show of support, a show of force that we are doing right now. Yes, Saeed. Yes, we can. non -talk talks. You know, could you uh, update us on what has transpired mm -hmm. since last night, uh, since the Secretary announced he was not going to Ramallah? I can. Uh, well, our team remains on the ground. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Indik and the team remains on the ground uh, in touch with both parties. As I said, the Secretary spoke today with Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas. Uh, what we've said uh, is this is one of those points in the negotiations where each side has to make tough choices. Uh, we've been clear that they've made courageous decisions throughout this process, uh, but we can't make the hard choices for them. And uh, throughout this process, we have been engaged with both sides uh, because it, it has been, it continues to be, uh, and it will in the future be the right thing for the United States to do. You know, I think it's an easy story to write uh, to say that making Middle East peace is hard. It's not a tough story to write. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're focused on right now is working with the two sides, uh, again, because it's the right thing to do to see if they can make some more tough choices and to see if we can make some progress here 
uh, going forward. And again, the team remains on the ground. The secretary is in touch with the team. So the talks are not at a dead end at this point? Not at all. Okay. Are no. you aware of any meetings between uh, Palestinian negotiator Arakat and Israeli negotiator Livni today? Uh, I can check on that. I'll, I can get the latest update from our team on the ground. Okay. And uh, as far as you're concerned, you're not assigning, since you are not uh, calling the talk to be over, mm -hmm. you are not assigning any blame to any one particular party. Absolutely not. Look, to be clear, over the last 24 hours, there have been unhelpful actions taken on both sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think it was a productive time for the secretary to return to the region. That's why right. he didn't go today. Right. Uh, but we're not playing the blame game. Right. Again, uh, what we're focused on uh, is seeing if we can make progress. Uh, there, is a, there is a chance to move this process forward. Right. There is still a chance for this right. that will require tough decisions by both of the parties. They've made tough decisions up until this point, but we can't make them for them. They need to make them now. Now, the uh, agencies, the type of agencies that Abbas announced and so on, mm -hmm. Uh, were in fact, as articulated by the secretary himself, uh, mm -hmm. they are not really that important in terms of, you know, uh, shifting or, or I don't doing think you said they were unimportant. Well, they're important, but they're not the mm -hmm. kind of agencies that uh, would threaten or would actually go contrary to Palestinian promises. He said that the Palestinians adhere to their promises. Well, he? what I just said, without going into more details, is that mm -hmm. we've seen both sides take some unhelpful actions over the past 24 hours and didn't think uh, it was a conducive environment in which the secretary should travel there right now. Uh, but again, uh, what we're focused on is how to move this process forward. Uh, it's up to the two parties to determine what the path forward looks like. As we go forward, obviously our team will continue working with them. I don't have anything to add to what the secretary said yesterday in terms of the specific announcements would, would the path forward uh, mm -hmm. include, the, let's say, Israeli pull back from Area C, so to speak, you know, and allow more movement? for the Palestinian Authority, uh, and would it include also the release of more prisoners? I'm just not going to get into specifics about what that path forward might look like. Uh, I will reiterate again that both parties have to make tough decisions. We can't make them for them. It's up to them. We will play a role as we have. The Secretary has worked, I think, a as hard as humanly possible on this issue because it's the right thing to do. Everywhere he goes around the world, people want to ask him about Middle East peace. You know, people talk a lot about U.S. leadership in the world, whether we've disengaged. The fact that we are heavily engaged in trying to solve one of the toughest challenges in the world right now, I think, flies in the face of that false notion that some people have put out there. So, uh, again, it's not uh, a hard story to write that it's hard, that it's tough, uh, but that's exactly why we think it's so important to make progress here. Are you aware of uh, the um, Jewish Republican Coalition meeting that took place in Las Vegas and was attended by prominent uh, Republicans, including former Vice President Cheney, who basically called the Secretary of the Administration and Secretary of State in particular policies in the Middle East a total failure from one failure to another. Aware I, I'm that? aware of the meeting. I haven't seen, okay. quite frankly, or had time to look at any of those specific comments. What I've been focused on, what our right. team has been focused on, is the work at hand mm -hmm. and making progress, working with the parties, and figuring out where this all goes from here if they're willing to make tough choices. I, quite frankly, don't have time to read what former officials say at some meeting in Los Angeles. But you Vegas. certainly disagree with Mr. Cheney that your policies in the Middle East peace process has failed in Iraq and with Iran has failed and Syria has failed all over. Absolutely. Again, I didn't see his specific comments, but uh, when you look at Middle East peace, uh, we've made uh, a lot of progress here, quite frankly. Uh, there's much more work to be done, and there's still room to make more progress, but certainly uh, we've made progress with the two parties. On Iran, uh, we have them at the negotiating table today with our P5 plus one partners. Their nuclear program is, for the first time in almost a decade, halted. I don't think that ever occurred uh, when the former official you were referring to was in office. So I think that right now what we're seeing is a diplomatic opportunity we've never had before. On Syria, it's a tough challenge. Nobody's naive about that. We are uh, continuing to try to uh, move the ball forward on that as well. What's the progress that you've made on the peace process? Well, uh, we've seen eight months of very intense negotiations <laughs> where both parties have made courageous decisions, uh, not only uh, through uh, the decisions of both parties, but through the Secretary's direct uh, involvement did we get the talks restarted, which was a very important milestone. Uh, we've had eight months of, of negotiations where we've narrowed gaps, they've made uh, tough decisions, uh, and where we still, we know we still have more work to do, but that's certainly been moving the ball forward. The question now is whether the two parties
can make the tough decisions to keep moving the ball down the field. You, you're running out of time, and you still have around 28 days to achieve an agreement. Do you still uh, consider that you are able to achieve an agreement uh, in this upcoming weeks? Look, we know this process is going to be very difficult. What we're focused on now uh, is in a time frame. It's not uh, a date on a calendar. It's whether, again, I know I sound a little bit like a broken record today, but whether the two parties can take this moment, which is a tough moment. We've seen tough moments before. Uh, but take this tough moment, make tough decisions, uh, and move the process forward. <clears throat> but as I said very clearly, we still do believe there is a path forward here. Our team remains on the ground. The Secretary just today has had conversations with both uh, leaders uh, and is trying to move the ball forward. So uh, that's what we're focused on right now. Prime Minister Netanyahu, mm -hmm. did the Secretary uh, discuss the issue of Israel moving forward on another 700 homes in East Jerusalem? I don't have any details to read out from their conversations. Yes, the Middle East peace? Uh -huh. Because you, you mentioned that you, we don't want to play the blame game. Absolutely. Okay. But it seems that two sides are blaming you that, <laughs> that you are not coming to a conclusion. I mean, how you can not blame them, at least explain to them what's going on. Well, I said that both sides did take some unhelpful actions over the past 24 hours. So I did say that there were some things done on both sides that we didn't think were particularly conducive to moving the process forward. But again, this is not about the United States. Yeah. Uh, we engage in this because it's the right thing to do uh, for the Palestinians and for the Israelis. We've been very clear about that, even though it's tough. But again, this is, this is up to them to make these tough decisions. We believe they can. Uh, but it is up to them. There is another question probably Said asked and you mentioned in, in the different times. The, the issue of the cancellation, or, or maybe you don't like that term, which was used yesterday of the trip, of the second mm -hmm. trip to Israel. Still, it's not clear why. The reason I'm asking, because always mm -hmm. when there was any problem, you said engagement is necessity Absolutely. To, to, to make it. But this time there's, it was disengagement, not engagement. No, I, I wouldn't say that. It's a different kind of engagement. So first, we didn't think that in this environment, after some of the actions we've seen over the past 24 hours, uh, not, in response, not in response to any one thing, but the totality of the actions on both sides, that it was conducive for the, uh, for the Secretary to travel back to the region right now. Uh, but that doesn't mean we disengage. The team remains on the ground, deeply engaged with both sides. And again, as I just said, the secretaries had phone conversations with both parties today. So uh, again, in Brussels, he had five bilats uh, about really important issues today, including Ukraine. So it's not that he just decided not to go and, and just took a 24-hour vacation. Uh, he has other things he's focused on. He's had important phone calls with both parties today. We will remain engaged. We will remain uh, in contact with both parties. And our team will remain on the ground to see if we can uh, get the two parties to move this process forward. I'm not going to play the blame <laughs> game. I'm really not. I know it's a tempting question to ask. We've seen uh, unhelpful actions on both sides, but I would also reiterate that both sides have made courageous decisions throughout this process, and we believe there's still room and time uh, for the two parties to keep doing so. Yeah. Anything else on Middle East peace? I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about became aware of the unhelpful actions because it seemed with some of the conflicting statements as the news was coming out of the Middle East that it would have come as a surprise or that, that the U.S. side was caught off guard. Can you talk a little bit well, about Well, I'm not going to further outline what those unha unhelpful actions were on each side, so unfortunately I can't get into more of a TikTok. But I think mm -hmm. uh, the sense that emerged over the last 24 hours, uh, certainly now probably more like 36, uh, that uh, both sides have taken some unhelpful actions. And the secretary, I mean, I stood up here in the briefing room yesterday and said he was still going. Uh, there was a decision made uh, shortly after that he would not be. So it's a very fluid situation. And I don't think anyone can accuse him of not being willing to go or engage. But this just wasn't the right time uh, for him to do so. He is, he is scheduled to come home this weekend after Morocco, yes. Yeah, were you caught off guard then? Uh, I'm not By the to, Palestinian action? It's, it's, I'm not going to characterize it any further, Said. It's a fluid situation. It's moving very quickly. I'm not going to characterize privately what our discussions looked like leading up to or during or after any of these actions. So do you feel that Abbas may be committed an underhanded uh, thing by going I am right not before at all the, going to the play Secretary this blame State game. Was, we was saw unhelpful actions leave. on both sides. I am not going to further characterize the actions of either party. In but he did, he did catch you by surprise, right? I'm not going to further characterize it, Said. Anything else on Middle East peace? Were you fully briefed on the 
decision in advance? <laughs> I was not, no. I was out here briefing you all. Um, I'm not going to get into what the discussions with the team were like before, or during, or after these conversations. Yes. To Asia we can we can always pivot to Asia. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, on Japan, uh -huh. um, what's your reaction on Japan and its uh, export uh, weapon export ban? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we welcome this revised Japanese policy on defense equipment exports. It expands opportunities uh, and simplifies processes for defense industry cooperation with the U.S. and other partner nations. Uh, what the change really does is allow Japan to modernize uh, its defense industry and processes so it can participate in the 21st century global acquisition marketplace. We think it's mutually beneficial for both Japan and cooperating nations, I would assume including us. But I mean, given the timing, you know, China and uh, South Korea both come out and they, they, they have concern about the regional tension and the transparency of this ban. Um, do you share the concern with your ally, South Korea? Uh, well, I haven't seen those specific comments. Obviously, we believe this is a good step. We welcome this step. And we have noted that Japan has been very transparent, as it's discussed, uh, all issues relating to uh, defense, both publicly but also with us as well, uh, which we think is a good thing. Um, Do you have one more? I have one on Philippines. Does anyone else want anything else on Japan? Okay, we'll do Philippines, and then I'll go to you next. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Have you seen the Chinese ambassador during Philippines' statement on China is, China is rejecting Philippines' proposal to bring this issue to international arbitration? What is your response to that? Yes. Wait, which issue specifically are you talking about? The second Thomas Scholl? Yes. Yes, I do and think I, I have mean, that. Let me China check and see if I still have that. Um, let me see what I have. We obviously believe this is an issue that should be resolved uh, with international resolution. I'm not sure I have the uh, specifics about the uh, what you mentioned in terms of the filing, I can get that for you, though. But if China is rejecting to go to the international arbitration, what's the next step? Let me check with our folks and see. I know they have some more details on that. I'm sorry I don't have it for you. Yes? Yeah, um, back on the topics of the topic of weapons, uh, the South yeah. Koreans discovered two North Korean very crudely designed drones. Um, one of the drones were believed to have images from the uh, the Korean Blue House. Does the State Department have oh. any comments um, on that? Or? I, for anything they've said, I would refer you to them. I'm happy to see if there's anything we have to say on it, not to my knowledge. Do we have a comment on it? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to our uh, one. Does the State Department have an update on the visa application of Amid Abu Talibi to be Iran's next ambassador to the United Nations? Uh, to be their next perm rep, yes. Let me look and see what I have on that. So no update. Obviously, we don't talk about visa cases individually as they're being adjudicated. Uh, so I won't go into the, spe the specifics of this case, uh, but I will say that we think this nomination would be extremely troubling. Uh, we're taking a close look at the case now, and we've raised our serious concerns about this possible nomination with the government of Iran. I'm not going to get into specifically how we've done that, but we have done that. Uh, as host nation of the UN, except for in limited ex exceptions, we're generally obligated, as folks know, under an agreement between the U.S. and the UN to admit the chosen representatives of permanent uh, of member states into the U.S. for purposes of representing their country at the UN. But no predictions in terms of this specific visa case for you. Senator, excuse me, one more, Arshad, one more. Senator Schumer, in a letter to the Secretary, mm -hmm. used slightly stronger language. He said that Hamid Abu Talibi is a, quote, major conspirator to the hostage crisis. Um, do you have reaction to that? Well, uh, we're still taking a close look at the case in terms of this individual uh, uh, mm -hmm. about, and I'm not going to comment on him specifically, uh, but we do take our obligations as host nation for the United Nations very seriously. Again, I don't have any specifics to preview for you in terms of his case. And numerous uh, former hostages uh, who were held for 444 days, you can understand their outrage. There's mm -hmm. been numerous statements in the past uh, 24 hours. Uh, do you have any message uh, to them? Well, I said that it is extremely troubling to us and that it raises some questions that we have raised directly with the Iranian government. We obviously, many of those hostages you know, we're State Department people, right. uh, and we very much value their service, and we'll keep having the conversation. Do you, does the State Department view this as a, a, quote, slap to the face? A number of people have used that reference. And is not it also a slap to the face to the ongoing uh, nuclear uh, negotiations with Iran? Well, I'm not going to describe it that way. Obviously, it's troubling. We'll talk about this with the Iranians. But the nuclear negotiations <clears throat> are separate. But uh, the fact that we're negotiating on the nuclear issue, which is incredibly important to us, uh, doesn't negate the serious problems we have with Iran's behavior in a number of areas, including Syria, including with terrorists, uh, including with human rights. 
So uh, the nuclear negotiations uh, we're focused on. We go back to Vienna next week for the third round of comprehensive negotiations, and we're very much focused on seeing if we can get a comprehensive agreement. You're right that there's separate issues, the nuclear negotiations and this appointment. However, in terms of just uh, having a willing partner, what does this say about our relationship Well, I would right note now? that Iran has, until this point, upheld every commitment it made in the joint plan of action, uh, which was obviously the first step uh, nuclear agreement we reached last November in Geneva. So uh, we can only judge them by their actions. On the nuclear issue, they have upheld their commitments. We hope they will continue to. Uh, and that's what we'll judge them on in terms of the P5 plus 1 talks going forward. So Iran should be commended for their actions of late. I in no way said that. Yes. What else? Syria? Oh, so on Iran? Yeah. Uh, on Mr. Abu Talebi's, um being named, um, is the State Department looking into exactly what his involvement may or may not have been in the hostage situation? Well, the U.S. government is certainly looking into this case. And in terms of him, I just don't have anything further for you on that. Mm -hmm. On Syria, on the Syrian embassy, now that it, the it Syrian has been embassy in D.C. In, in or Washington, our embassy there? In, in Washington, now that has been completely closed and no third party was named and nobody's taking care of. It. Do you provide security for such a? You know, a, a structure, uh, the, build, the building itself? That's a good question. Yeah. I, don't, I honestly don't know the answer. Or is I'm it, is it the responsibility it. of the city police? Or, I mean, how it's is actually a good question. There, there's stories from time to time about embassies that are no longer uh, okay. occupied in Washington. Okay. I'm happy to check. Okay. And I did have an update. Folks have asked about Special Envoy Rubenstein's travel. I just wanted to give folks right. an update because yes. I, had, I know people had asked. Uh, he returned to Washington on March 31st. Uh, he went to Turkey, where he met with members of the Syrian opposition, including SOC President Jarba, uh, reaffirmed our support for the moderate Syrian opposition. He also met with Turkish officials on the issue. Uh, he went to Geneva, where he met with a range of humanitarian professionals and international organizations, uh, leadership, and continued the discussions on how we can address the humanitarian catastrophe in Syria. In Paris, he met with French officials as well as members of the opposition, also met with Joint Special Representative Brahimi, where they discussed the political track uh, moving forward and how we could make some progress there. And lastly, he went to Amman where he met with Syrian opposition members and Jordanian officials to continue our close coordination on the issue. I know folks had some questions about travel. Can I yes. Iran real quick? Uh -huh. Does Iran ever apologize for its role in the 1979 hostage crisis? I don't know. Would you like to see an apology if this ambassador, uh, um, Mr. Abid Talibi, will go forward? Would you like to see an apology from the nation of Iran? I'm not going to make predictions here. Uh -huh. Chance look at the situation on northern Syria and Latakia. The I don't have any Latakia. update for you in terms of the battlefield situation. I checked with our folks. There was no update. Anything else on Syria? And what's his next plan for Syria? The special envoy? Yeah. Uh, in terms of travel? Yeah, any action, any uh, agenda? Any well, what we're really focused on right now is a couple of things. Obviously, how we can get Geneva 2 back on track. And really, Joint Special Representative Brahimi is focused on that. We're focused on how we can support that process, particularly with the opposition side as well, continuing our support for the opposition, uh, continuing to work with the Russians and others on the chemical weapons destruction. So uh, those are certainly things that are ongoing. Also continuing on the heels of the President and the Secretary's trip last week to talk to our partners in the region about how we can support the opposition, including Saudi Arabia and others. Bring, bring, so bring the Geneva talks back with the Russians? Uh, well, certainly we want to see how we can get the diplomatic track back on track. With the Russians? Uh, well, between the two parties. But yes, we convened it with the UN, under the UN auspices between us, the Russians, as host nations, uh, and then with the opposition and the regime. Yes. Any decision regarding delivering my pets to the rebels? No, nothing has changed. You want me to repeat the line again from the other day? Yes, Our position please. on this has not changed. It didn't even come up during the discussion with the Saudi cane, contrary to some reports. Uh, it's just not an issue that was discussed. Mary, do you feel that the uh, Syria issue has been eclipsed by the Ukrainian issues giving advantage to government forces to go and do plenty of what they are doing now? Not at all. I think that uh, the Secretary and his team and the people who work in this building and around the world can focus on many different things at once. Obviously, we have teams in place working every single day on both issues. Uh, I would entirely take uh, exception to that idea. Uh -huh. um, do you have any comment on uh, a report that Iran and Russia are making progress toward their proposed barter mm -hmm. deal? Well, I don't have any confirmation of those reports. I know this has been out there as a rumor for a while. Uh, we have made our concerns crystal clear. 
uh, to both sides uh, that uh, if the deal were to move forward, it would raise serious concerns. It would be inconsistent with the terms of the P5 plus one joint plan of action, could potentially trigger U.S. sanctions against the entity and individuals involved in any related transaction. So as I said, we've talked to both sides about <clears throat> how concerned we would be if this were to move forward, but I can't actually confirm that it is. Okay. And this is, I mean, that's identical, I think, to what you said about it in January when it first came out, right? And I have no indication it's moved anywhere since then. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. At the beginning of this briefing, you mentioned the statement about what happened this morning uh -huh. and you condemned it. How do you see it? Is because you said the terrorist acts and all this description. How do you see this is different from other times, especially because the other times you were always stressing other incidents, similar incidents, or maybe not similar from your perspective. Mm -hmm. You're asking for reconciliation and all these things. This time you didn't mention that. Well, I was condemning a terrorist attack near the university. Obviously, our position on Egypt at large hasn't changed, that we need the government, the opposition, uh, all parties and groups to work together inclusively to see if we can move Egypt forward here. We have seen, as we've talked about a lot in here, some very troubling developments over the past several weeks in Egypt. Uh, so we're continuing to have those conversations <coughs> as well. I would say that uh, Senior Advisor to the Secretary Ambassador David Thorne and State Department <coughs> Counselor Ambassador Tam Thomas Shannon are leading the U.S. delegation that includes the Treasury Department and the NSC. They're in Cairo from March 31st to April 3rd, so right now as we speak. They're meeting with senior Egyptian officials and business leaders to discuss ways to support Egypt, uh, to encourage a sustainable and nonviolent transition to democracy, and explore ways to strengthen the Egyptian economy. So there's a delegation there right now engaging at a very high level about how we can work with them uh, going and forward. And as much as I remember, this is the same delegation was in UAE mm -hmm. and other places to support together. Apparently they like traveling together, yes. Okay. It is. It is. So there, there is another issue which is related to Egypt in the the Prime Minister of British Prime Minister orders inquiry into Muslim Brotherhood in London. I saw those reports. Let me check with our. I, I don't. Yes, I, please. Do you I want mean, to comment on that or comment on that? I mean, it's let like. Let me check with our. Do you think it's a proper thing to do? How it is proper? Yeah. And because you know, it's 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 good looking to through Muslim Brotherhood activities, whether political or military. Let me check with our folks and see. I don't have the specifics. I have. And if you, if you are going, you are appreciating something like this or thinking it's an obstacle in the reconciliation that you are asking for? Yeah, let me let me check with our team. I did see those reports. Lucas. Yeah. Um, Libya? Uh -huh. uh, Marie, the State Department has always emphasized its commitment to implementing the security-related recommendations mm -hmm. in the Accountability Review Board that produced a report after the Benghazi attacks. Uh -huh. Uh, but now there's a new report uh, from the Office of the Inspector General of the State Department just released, which finds that more than a year and a half after the Benghazi attacks, the State Department does not have any systems in place to track requests for security upgrades or what was done to them, which includes as a result, and I quote from the report, could not ensure that the highest priority physical security related needs at overseas posts were corrected and that post vulnerability to threats has been sufficiently reduced. Do you care to comment on this report? When did you say the IG report was released? Uh, it was dated March 2014. Uh, okay, I, have not, I haven't read the IG report. Uh, I'm happy to take a look at it and see if we're going to respond. Okay. One more from mm -hmm. the report. Uh, there's but obviously we have made significant progress in terms of ARB implementation. Uh, including on security, but let me take a look at the specific IG but this report. this Inspector Review Boards let me just says otherwise. It. I'll check on it. Uh, not that everything says, an IG says is fact, Exactly, and I just am not familiar with the specifics. Okay, uh, one more quote from the report is, uh -huh. the lack of standard documented policies and procedures may result in post-physical security needs not being addressed adequately and promptly. Uh, bottom line, aren't these findings a damning indictment on the laxity of the security of the Obama administration and the post-Clinton and now Kerry uh, offices? Well, I'd make a few points. The first is that we take security of our posts around the world incredibly seriously. seriously. These are procedures that are not put in place, quote, by the Obama administration. These are State Department procedures put in place by a lot of foreign service officers and civil service officers and people who've served under many administrations, both Democrat and Republican. So what we've said post Benghazi is that we are 100% committed uh, to making sure our people have the security they need overseas. We are implementing the ARB recommendations. We know we can do better, and we have been doing better. 
so uh, again, I'm not familiar with the IG report. I'm happy to take a look mm -hmm. at it. But the notion that somehow this administration or this secretary does not take security incredibly seriously and has not moved to implement additional security measures is just not correct. We know you, from the podium you've said how uh, s seriously you take security. Mm -hmm. And for months and uh, almost a year and a half now, you've said we are planning on implementing the findings of the ARB. Mm -hmm. And this report says otherwise. Well, as I said, we've, we've put out multiple documents talking about ARB implementation in terms of uh, what we've done to implement their findings. We've implemented many, many of them. So again, I will take a look at the IG report, uh, and maybe I can comment on it tomorrow. Yep. Uh -huh. Another um, IG, this is a letter, actually, on Afghanistan, um, Boglin Prison. Have you seen this I'm safety sorry, I haven't. I need to check, clearly check in with our IG folks. Okay. Um, I'll is send it, it to you. Is it from the, yeah, send it to me, and I'll get you something. Thank you. Yes. Do you have an IG question also? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the secretary met uh, with the foreign minister of Turkey. Do you have a readout? And if they discuss uh, Cyprus? I don't have any readout from their conversation. Can you check for us? I will check. Uh, can, uh, can you tell us if the secretary and Mr. Davuto will talk about the elections? I will check and see if I can get you a readout. I just don't know what they talked about. Do you have anything about A constitutional court's decision about the two leader ban in Turkey? My, because the U.S. Embassy in Turkey just uh, release a statement about how they are welcoming the decision. Well, of the clearly we said court. that the Twitter ban needs to end. Uh, and any court decision would need to be implemented to ensure that it does end. I know this just happened, I think, very today. recently today. So I defer to the folks on the ground. But obviously, we think it needs to end. And if there's been a court decision, we think it needs to be implemented quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Just Twitter or Twitter and YouTube? I, it's my understanding the court ruling was just about Twitter. Oh, yeah. Um, but we obviously don't think YouTube should be banned either. Anything no, else? Uh huh. Uh, the death toll as a result of violence in, in March was 1,888 uh, in Iraq, and as we're getting closer to the election day, what is the United States providing in terms of security aid going mm -hmm. to, to to help the government of Iraq stemming the violence? Well, uh, a few points. Let me be clear that the elections need to happen. We have every expectation they will. This is an important step forward for the people of Iraq uh, in choosing what they want their country to look like going forward. So elections need to happen uh, as scheduled. Uh, we are concerned by the continued escalation of violence uh, in Iraq. Uh, we know there's been uh, a number of uh, adverse impacts on the population, including massive civilian displacement. In terms of security assistance, I don't think I have anything new to update you for on that, uh, I would, and so we are working very closely with the Iraqi government on the security issue. Uh, I can see if there's more update for you on what we've provided. Uh, we uh, believe it's very, as I said, very important for these elections to go forward. Uh, they've held successful elections in the past uh, during periods of significant violence, uh, which is obviously not uh, the situation we want to see. But I think I just want to underscore the importance uh, for the Iraqi people of these elections going forward. Could you, uh, in um, these deliveries that were promised in the last fall, mm -hmm. uh, could you update us? Or, you know, Which uh, ones are you talking about specifically? Well, there were, you know, the, the Hellfire missiles, uh -huh. the, you know, uh, other, other equipment, helicopters. And, yep. And let me so, see. Yeah. Saeed, let me take that and check with our folks and see what has been delivered. Wait, one more on that IG report from mm -hmm. the ARB. Okay. Is the IG required to announce to you when they issue a report? I realize you're responsible for all the world's events and can't right. keep up with but them. But they're independent. The IG is independent. So they supposed so to. So I don't. I don't know. They can release something just quietly. <laughs> I have no idea what the procedures like for how they can release things. I will check on this. Yes, in the back. These uh, reports about the um, Art and Embassy program mm -hmm. purchasing a four hundred thousand dollar camel statue for Islamabad Embassy. Um, can you comment on that and the reaction that that's been getting? Yeah. Um, and the Art and Embassy program more generally. Yes, absolutely. Let me uh, just give you folks a little bit of background here. Uh, we are the department is currently building a new embassy in Islamabad. Uh, so what w the procedure we go through when we build new embassies is to have our folks curate them, get pieces of art to curate our embassies for a number of reasons. The the you know the most important of which is that our embassies are the face of the United States overseas. And what better re way to represent U.S. culture? These would be uh, pieces taken from American artists, Pakistani American artists, and Pakistani artists themselves. So what better way to showcase the United States culture than through this program? Uh, when we build new embassies, uh, we spend less than 0.5 percent 
uh, of our construction budget on the entire art collection, just to put it into some perspective for how much this costs. Uh, we also have over $300 million of art that's on loan to us, that artists have donated to us for free, for no cost, to display around the world at our embassies as well. So I just want to put into perspective a little bit. Uh, obviously, we believe very strongly in the art and embassies program. We think it fosters cultural connections. Uh, we think it's an important way to showcase uh, the cultures, uh, both ours and the host country, bring them together and showcase them for our visitors to these embassies. So right now, we're still making decisions about what the art will look like specifically in our embassy in Islamabad. We haven't made any final decisions about that piece or any other piece. It's my understanding. Uh, we're still trying to make those determinations. But uh, if there's any update, I'm happy to get it for you. But some of this stuff is pretty amazing if you've been to our embassies around the world. Uh, it really is a good way to showcase our artists. And I think they take uh, quite a bit of pride. And I think there's a sense of patriotism if they do have something uh, displayed in one of our embassies. The um, plans for Embassy Islamabad was mm -hmm. announced, or the plans were announced. Mm -hmm. um, it was then thought to be, it was going to be the largest U.S. embassy in the world, basically, mm -hmm. and at that time it would have surpassed Baghdad, which in itself is ginormous. So um, I'm wondering if there's been any kind of reassessment in the years since mm -hmm. then as the posture has changed in the region. In terms as it, of size? In, time, in terms of size, uh -huh. which I think would relate directly to how much is spent on art, right? I mean, if the embassy... If it's 0.5% of the construction budget. And this construction budget is much smaller because the I will, footprint I will is be smaller. happy to check. I actually yeah. don't know the answer. I'd, I'd be, be interested. Thanks. Yes. But it is a pretty amazing program, just so folks know. What else? Anything else? Great. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.